Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, depending on where, where you are. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mark Ayer. I am a senior consulting analyst at S&P Global Market Intelligence 451 Research. And with me today, I have Matt Warner, who is the Chief Technology Officer for Bloomira. And today we're going to talk about XDR or Extended Detection and Response Solutions for Small and Medium Sized Businesses, and particularly how SMBs or small to medium sized businesses are accelerating proactive and responsive security adoption. All right, so I'm gonna uh, introduce myself and then I'll pass it over to Matt and he can uh, talk about himself as well. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm a senior consulting analyst here at S&P. Um, been here about 18 months, uh, coming off of almost 13 years at IBM, uh, where I was a, uh, started out in uh, the, with the big fix acquisition as a product marketer, and then I moved into product management uh, under Curator Sim. I did that for a number of years, and then I uh, wound up my career there running uh, security sales and ailment uh, under the uh, threat management side of the business. Uh, I've got about 20 years in security and a couple decades more than that overall in technology, so uh, definitely been around. And uh, so today, my, uh, what I do at SMP is I focus on cybersecurity almost exclusively, um, doing a lot of work with vendors like Blue Mira and others, and. Um, and so it's yeah, it's a great uh, great gig. Been really enjoying it. All right, I'm gonna pass it over to Matt. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> I'm Matt Warner. I'm the founder and CTO of Bloomira. Uh, excited to be here and chat with SMP about XDR. Uh, my background is in offensive and defensive security as well as software engineering. Um, my, and you know, I've started a number of uh, data encryption startups all the way up to here we are now with the SIM. Uh, and my focus has always been how to really solve problems from the SMB and mid-market angle and how to really best help uh, the needs of cybersecurity inside of that, that segment of the market. Uh, it's a uniquely difficult segment. Uh, most technologies are not made for smaller security teams or smaller IT teams. Uh, and I, you know, most of my career is how can we figure out ways to make life easier for smaller teams of IT and cybersecurity people. Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, before we move ahead, uh, let me just cover a couple of housekeeping items, uh, which typically come up. Uh, this session is being recorded, so the recording will be posted shortly after the completion of today's session. Uh, we'll also be posting, I believe already have posted the slides for download, so feel free to do that. Uh, we are taking Q&A through the Q&A panel, which you'll find, I believe, on the right side of your screen. Just look for it. says should say Q&A. And feel free to enter questions at any point during today's session. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run through the slides, which should take about 35 or 40 minutes. And then with the balance of the session, we'll uh, take your questions. And so, but again, you can enter questions any, any time uh, during the session. And I believe that is about it. So let's move along here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the key trends in SMBs, again, as small and medium businesses, uh, in terms of proactive and responsive security technology spend. And what's really interesting to me, um, you know, I've spent a pretty good chunk of my career working for SMBs uh, and also designing solutions for SMBs. And so, and I actually was an SMB, I had my own consulting firm uh, for about five years. And so, you know, the challenges of SMBs, particularly from the security side of things, are very different, you know, from larger organizations. And in my opinion, they were really underserved for a long time, you know, they, uh, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But, you know, what we're seeing here at SMP, so we run these, these surveys on a continual basis that we call Voice of the Enterpriser Vote. And uh, we've been running these for uh, many of these for over a decade. And what's really cool about that is that we can look at trends going back, you know, a few years and then compare them with like our current uh, year's results. What we're looking at here is a result of one of those surveys. And uh, that's where we asked uh, respondents about their plans for increasing or decreasing their security spend uh, this year. And then we also looked at last year. And what's really interesting here, if you look at the start at the top there, where it says no change, so a significant decrease, about 20 percentage points over last year and this year. So the top bar would be 2022, the bottom bar would be 2023. So about 20 percentage points, a decrease in organizations that not aren't changing. <laughs> and then if you look at those that are planning a slight increase, uh, it was actually down one percentage point. So in other words, basically even. But what's really interesting, if you look at the bottom there, 
is how many of those organizations plan a significant increase. And that's 21 percentage points just in one year. And that is definitely a sea change. And so, you know, and I think one of the reasons for that is, and we'll get into this in a little bit, is that there are a uh, number of solutions now that are emerging that are specifically for SMBs, particularly in the XDR space. Uh, Matt, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think it's a mix of new technologies being available and just continued pressure from cyber insurance and other sort of compliances that have continued to, to grow. Um, if you even are a smaller public company, the SEC is watching you much closer than they were last year even. So we've continued to see these changes in the market that have pushed organizations in a direction where they have to increase. Maybe that will result in a significant increase, especially if you have not really invested yet in technology, you want to get cyber insurance and they come to you and say, here's this questionnaire, do you have these things? It can be a very big kind of surprise of like, oh, this is a lot that I need to get into this environment. So I, I do think it's um, definitely that there's more technology available to people, but also there's this, you know, the deeper focus on ransomware that only grows, how do we cover it? Well, we'll just get it by putting a cyber insurance um, mark in front of this, and that doesn't necessarily solve the problem, but that increased spend, more of a focus on cybersecurity and IT can definitely help solve the problem. So I, I think we're seeing this kind of market driven through compliancy, which is kind of an inevitability in security to an extent, um, but we're also seeing that adopted through technology that is built for these organizations. So ideally better results as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Moving right along. All right, so let's just cover a few of the uh, security challenges that are specific to SMB organizations. Now, the threat landscape is pretty interesting, you know, it, and it doesn't really matter what size of a company, you know, the threats are are equally applicable. And one might make the case that, you know, SMBs tend to be even more vulnerable because they don't have as much budget to, you know, apply towards, you know, large security operation centers and, you know, and hiring really high end analysts and all that sort of thing. So, you know, at at the one point, you know, threats are more sophisticated, you know, as Matt said, you know, ransomware in particular um, is is affecting every organization or can affect every organization, large and small, you know, and the attack surfaces are continuing just to expand, you know, things like, you know, uh, internet, internet of things, uh, devices that, that, you know, a lot of organizations are deploying, move to the cloud, um, you know, digital transformation, all those things tend to really expand the attack surface that an organization has to protect. And then the other problem was that incumbent or traditional security solutions, a lot of those really weren't designed, and that's kind of being covered in the next point as well, to meet the needs of the small and medium business. A lot of those, you know, coming from IBM, I saw this, you know, a lot, which was that, you know, a lot of those organizations uh, or the, the target of those companies, those vendors are medium to large enterprises, uh, you know, which kind of makes sense because that's kind of what their to traditional customers were. But the other thing that happens is that, um, you know, those organizations build those systems for large enterprises and they're not designed to scale down. You know, they can scale up to incredible quantities, uh, but not scale down. And also the pricing models tend to be for uh, medium and large enterprises. And uh, so, you know, an example of that would be, you know, organizations that have to, that buy products that are price based on, you know, data on ingest storage and processing. And then as you scale up, you know, those costs can spiral pretty much out of control. And, you know, that's not not great for any organization, but for uh, an SMB that's particularly uh, uh, price sensitive, that's that's a big problem. And then the other problem is that those solutions tend to require highly talented personnel who are also very expensive and also very hard to find. And so to whatever extent, uh, the security solutions that are designed for SMBs can kind of help take that away or can, you know, uh, do a lot of that, that, the tasks and the analytics that maybe a more specialized person can do, then that's, that's all good. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, there are a, a set of new XDR solutions that are emerging that are specifically designed for the SMB market. And I'll let um, Matt talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, and to, to echo Mark's point, the, the XDR market, I mean, really any, you know, the SIM market, XDR market, uh, the market of cybersecurity that involves kind of this growing data set that we all continue to create more of because 
you know, we continue to get more pressure for visibility, for data, and realistically, it's the only way to get that high fidelity detection capabilities that a lot of organizations are looking for is to pull in a lot of that data. And a lot of the technologies in general that are inside of the XDR market are really focused on cloud supported, like Microsoft Sentinel is a great piece of technology. But when you start to look at pricing, the difference between storing that data, getting that data in, and the difference between analyzing that data is like nearly a tenfold price increase, generally speaking, inside of Sentinel. So you, it's really easy to get caught in a situation where you're not sure if you're getting the value from your data for how much it costs. And or to get that value, you need to have people in place to drive the entire kind of car and make it go forward for you. So the the evolution that we're starting to see inside of the XDR market and a few other markets in cybersecurity of making it more straightforward from a pricing perspective, just as much as a usage perspective, uh, is really paramount when it comes to getting defense moving into the SMB market um, and sector that is really kind of just needed at this point. Uh, I think we can all look across enterprise companies and say, well, maybe that's not really going so great. Um, when we see you know, Boeing getting hit by Lockbit, uh, everyone getting hit by Lockbit really in the grand scheme of it all at this point, um, there is no one who is safe to, to Mark's point. We're all kind of potentially impacted by these attackers. So that means we all need to kind of grow in the same direction toward the ability to detect uh, and a lot of these technologies put that on the onus of the company to make it happen inside of their technology. Uh, and, you know, at least from my perspective, uh, that, that really needs to be flipped. Yeah, no, that makes sense. All right, well, let's talk about XDR. Um, and, and this is one of my favorite topics just because, you know, it's one of those acronyms, Extended Detection and Response. You know, it was, it was coined, I think, in 2019. So it's fairly new, you know, in, in, in uh, overall terms of, of the market. But what's interesting is, you know, and there's a lot of these out there now today uh, where it's a term that was coined. And at its core, it's a great idea, but then when you really think about it and how it's you know, put together uh, and how different vendors have implemented it, it's kind of all over the board, right? But let's talk about some of the typical characteristics of an XDR. Uh, one is that it tends to be cloud-based uh, and you know maybe even cloud-native is good. Um, and really, and then secondarily, it's a suite of solutions that are designed to tightly integrate with one another in a perfect world. It's the same user interface, all right? So you can kind of more or less seamlessly, and that's kind of a tricky, tricky point, but seamlessly move between various platforms uh, or different capabilities within the platform, I should say. Now, what's really interesting um, to me is that you see a couple of different approaches to this uh, that vendors have taken. One is where, you know, sort of like they're trying to boil the ocean and they're trying to maybe uh, provide, I shouldn't say boil the ocean, but they're trying to provide the entire suite of solutions natively, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, at one-stop shop, uh, which is great because you get all the solutions, you know, a, a common UI, uh, you know, they typically would be based on a common data lake and so on. And, you know, so it just, it makes it easier. But then others, and you tend to see this more on the upper end of the market, you know, the medium, large enterprise solutions for XDR, where they've already got a significant investment in one or more of the components of XDR. And, you know, the vendors realize that, hey, we don't want to force them to forklift, replace a big piece of this because they won't buy it, right? And so they've come up with these kind of hybrid solutions where they think, okay, well, we've got this UI and then through integrations, you know, we can we can try to, we can bring this into our UI. Um, but anyway, so you, you see the, the major components of XDR on there. You know, a key part of it is the analytics piece, threat detection response. Uh, you know, that's kind of uh, the classic uh, need of a lot of organizations. We need to be able to know what's going on and respond to them. Uh, security orchestration and response or SOAR is really all about, okay, we know we've got something we need to deal with. You know, it's, it's either a threat, maybe a compliance issue, whatever it might be. Now let's figure out who needs to do what and let's make sure it's being done. And, you know, and then providing the reporting and whatnot around that. Uh, endpoint detection and response or EDR, you know, which is kind of an outgrowth of the endpoint management market where you've got kind of an Uber agent uh, sitting on those endpoints, right? Which is not only doing things like assessing vulnerabilities and helping with patch management, but also uh, able to take 
active active actions uh, if there is an issue like quarantining or whatever it might be on that machine. And then of course, reporting back up into the threat detection response uh, capabilities. Um, and then lastly, you know, network protection and response or NDR. So again, taking a pr the perspective of the network and looking at what's happening there, you know, and correlating that with what's happening on the endpoint and all the other, other systems that you're monitoring. And then more importantly, or as importantly, it's all based on a common data lake, data model, and UI. So it all, all these pieces play together and, you know, can be monitored and managed through a single UI. And then lastly, you know, providing the options to purchase it, you know, as a fully self-managed, fully managed, or a hybrid service. So in other words, you want to manage it yourself and you have people do it, fine. If you want to go, you know, with a uh, managed service provider or a managed security service provider and have them manage it for you, that's fine too. Or a hybrid where, you know, maybe you manage it from eight to five, <clears throat> excuse me, eight to five. And then, you know, during the off hours or whatnot, then you, then you have uh, someone manage it for you. Any thoughts on that, Matt? Yeah, it's it's been very interesting to, to watch XDR grow, especially where it started with Palo Alto in 2018, and has really kind of grown into, you know, how do we make data available broadly to solve defense security problems and compliance problems? Uh, and, you know, the problems and needs of the enterprise are not the same as the needs of the SMB, which is to say, you know, most SMBs have never looked at doing SOAR, Whereas a lot of enterprise have probably looked at SOAR, they've tried to get Phantom going and Splunk, they may have partially got it going, they may not have fully got it deployed, but they know that's what they want to do. And you continue to see this dichotomy between the SMB and enterprise application of XDR and really how it could support that organization. Uh, and even when you see it from the standpoint of like, well, I know I need a Simmer and XDR, but I'm using, say, Sentinel-1 as my EDR uh, is that good enough? Should it just be an NGAV? Should it do something else? And for a lot of SMBs, you know, they often don't have enough internal security staff to make those determinations. So having a partner that can support them in that with fully managed with an MSP can definitely help across those. But in general, I, I think the, the part that's most important from my perspective is that that top one, which is to say when you pull in all of your endpoint data, when you pull in all your network data, when you have it built on this common model, is there still the analytics you need to solve problems and detect threats in your environment? And or do you have the staff internally to make it so it'll work for you? Um, because in a lot of cases, they'll pull in EDR, NDR data from your different environments. But it's also just as important to think about what are my compliance needs? What other data should I be pulling out of my environment? Will the XDR drive value to that data? Can I run a reports to get my PCI or NIST compliance data out of here? Or do I need to put a ton of work into doing my own analysis of this data? So I, I think this is a very good list. I also add in like, how can I make compliance work for me? Because an enterprise, you just, you know, you just throw it at you know, the team that's going to handle it. Whereas an SMB is just one tired person more often than not. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and to your point earlier, you know, compliance has become and continues to grow in importance yeah. for for SMBs as well as large enterprises. Uh, you know, a, a classic example of that is the uh, European GDPR, uh, where you know a lot of maybe U.S. based enterprises um, on the large side, you know, they've been doing business in Europe forever, and you know, so they just kind of do it. But uh, smaller organization SMBs may not have even thought about that. But you know, literally, if you do business. Uh, with a single customer in Europe, guess what? You fall under GDPR, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's really been driven down into the the small organizations as well. So, yeah, it's a it's a huge potentially a really huge has. issue. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about you know some of the uh, SMB's expectation expectations for XDR. Um, so. You know, primary requirements. You know, and the nice thing you know, about being an SMP SMB is, and especially if you're uh, have the luxury of sort of starting from scratch, if you will, or um, you know, deploying a solution, is your infrastructure is probably not nearly as complex as a large enterprise, right? And so, uh, but the need there is really around scalability. You know, you want to be able to you know, maybe start small and then just scale it up either as your business grows or, you know, or you want to expand out in terms of the capabilities. Uh, so, you know, scalability is and scaling up and down, uh, you know, as, as things change is really important. 
um, the ability to improve your security operations. So that's not only in terms of being able to uh, do it, you know, look, you know, looking at threat detection and response, but also being becoming more proactive and getting ahead of things uh, before they become a problem. Um, higher alert quality. You know, I, I, I've seen this time and time again. You know, where you put in a new tool and you turn it on, you know, and it's supposed to be great, and all of a sudden you've got a million alerts. You know, and, you know, you know, and you just can't make sense out of anything. Um, so really, being able to um, you know increase the signal to noise ratio, if you will, uh, on, on the alerts and just getting notified for the important things, really, really important. Um, and then increase visibility. You know, across the, the various systems. Um, so, and then on the responsive side, you know, and we kind of separate things between responsive and proactive. So our responsive is, you know, first of all, I want to be able to detect threats. That's pretty obvious. I want to be able to incorporate the endpoints in that. Uh, I want to be able to do case management, you know, uh, that's typically your SOAR capabilities and, and or integrating if you have a service desk solution uh, that you want to use, uh, be able to do that. And that falls into the third party integrations, um, not only on the service desk, but other investments that you may already have um, that you want to integrate. And then automation is particularly critical for an SMB because again, they don't have a hundred people working in the SOC. You know, they've got, uh, you know, depending on the size, you might have, you know, three people or 10 people or whatever it might be, right? And so automation of routine tasks really decreases the load on, on those analysts and, and makes them much more responsive and also makes, allows them to work on more interesting things than just watching, you know, a thousand alerts come in and try to figure out which one is the right one. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, proactive in, in a minute here. Uh, Matt, you want to? Yeah, the, of course. Yeah, the it's it's interesting um, in the SMB space, especially as it pertains to you know how do you really like w what is the goal of having an XDR sim in place? And and in most cases, it's you know detect threats before they get bad, stop ransomware before we get encrypted. Um, try to get some more insights if we can. You know, most of us haven't had experiences with Sims in our past where like, wow, this made my day great. Like it's often not <laughs> what you feel right. when you use a Sim or an XDR. And, you know, I think there's a potential for there to be a change in the market and for us to kind of look at cybersecurity a little differently. Uh, Cause yeah, we, we don't, I don't think any of us want people to spend their time just looking at alerts, like it doesn't mean anything. And when you're an SMB and you have those one to three people, that one to three people are probably also in charge of patch management, bone management, making sure that everything's running, making sure that everything is staying on, paying the bills for your data center. And when they have a million different things to do, they likely don't have enough time to focus on solving problems, even though they're the only ones with the context for why those problems are there. So it, it is really important to have that kind of holistic solution that allows your organization to really be successful within that tool. Uh, and, you know, I, I think this is a it's a kind of a perfect time for this world uh, in, in regard to the cybersecurity IT world of saying, you know, we deserve technology that works for us and with us and not technology that just kind of is there and expensive and it's not really built for our use case. Uh, and that does definitely include, you know, that case management, making sure that EDR is working for you, and really most importantly, making sure that all these pieces that are kind of shown here, we're going from scaling to detection to case management, is just something that's there and available for you to leverage as a part of your day to day, instead of it's something that you have to go in, build a process around, define it all, structure it all out. Like you don't need another Jira in your life. You need another something that that helps you either make your uh, be populated with information to your point of third party integrations or something that just makes it so you can focus on solving those problems as fast as possible that are important to your organization absolutely yeah and then on the proactive side you know proactive is an area where a lot of organizations uh they just didn't really focus on that for a long time because they couldn't mm -hmm. because they were so busy uh working on the responsive side you know yeah. just dealing with their day-to-day -day stuff they didn't have the luxury of actually taking the time out to say well how do we prevent some of this stuff how do we you know um, do threat hunting and and it's huge right i mean in terms yeah. talk about return on investment you know the time that you can spend doing pre threat hunting and proactively fixing things getting ahead of that ransomware or you know um or 
getting to the point where if you do have a breach that you can contain it quickly and minimize right. the damage from it is huge. You know, I mean, that's the, the ROI on that is in, almost incalculable, but uh, but it's yeah. it's critical. Thoughts yeah, it's it, threat hunting is it's such a uniquely difficult thing for SMBs. Um, because in, in large organizations, especially people that have been working in security have gone from a large organization to a smaller organization, and they quickly realize the amount of time available with threat hunting is like 30 minutes a week, like tops. Like, that's what you get. Right. And you can look at logs for like 30 minutes, and we got a million other things to do. And that leads very quickly to the idea that, well, maybe threat hunting isn't something that we have time for. Maybe this isn't working for what we're doing. And I think that there's a few different ways to, to go about it. We at, at Bumira look at it from the perspective of that it's the services responsibility. It's our responsibility to do threat hunting. It's our responsibility to look at data. It's our responsibility to generate alerts that are kind of proactive and before that, <laughs> which is to say like we, you and your organization should be aware when someone is running commands that look like reconnaissance in your environment. You could find those in threat hunting but it's just as easy to know when these things are happening. And if it's one of your internal IT staff, and let's say there's three or four of you, then you'll know that person. You can ask them, hey, did you do this? But if they are not the ones who ran Who Am I, that's that chance for you to get ahead of the ransomware, get it out of your environment before they actually move into dropping real malicious uh, droppers in that environment. They're going to result in you getting kind of just hit with crypto in general. So it's... I. I Threat hunting as a security person, like I will always love it. Like it's one of my favorite things. I just go through data and find bad stuff. But it's also one of those things that as someone who's now grown into having to run businesses, that it's like from the time availability, you're better off finding a partner that can help you be good at identifying those threats ahead of time and less than until you have like an unlimited budget. And when you have that, then when you have an unlimited budget, you're good to go on threat hunting. Yeah, and you make a really good point. And that is, you know, in terms of being proactive, it isn't just threat hunting. It's right. doing all those other, you know, things that you can do to, to uh, prevent and or, you know, kind of shift left, if you, if you will, on the attack right. chain, right? Uh, yep. You know, the quicker we can shut down something like that, then the less likely there's going to be a problem, which falls sort of under responsive, but it's responsive at the early stage of the attack chain, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we, you know, there's the classic... NGAV pattern, next gen antivirus pattern, where it's like, we're going to stop the bad thing that it happens, which is great. But we, don't we all want to get like four steps before that when they just start and stop them then, not when you hope your NGAV successfully stops that, that attack that's going to land. So it, it is only for the best. And in the grand scheme of it all, like we can look back at like the move it attack uh, from the Clop ransomware group. Just being able to detect when someone is attacking your IIS server gave you the ability to detect that attack on your move it boxes. So it, it, it really is a how do I get visibility broadly and how do I find that partner that's going to help me get ahead of these kind of threats before they happen? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's talk about a few other considerations. We've touched on you know, a number of these already, but you know, on, on the compliance, you know, we already kind of talked about how SMBs base much many of the same compliance requirements as a, as a large organization. You know, they need to, to be able to do monitoring, reporting, collecting logs, and centralizing and protecting those logs uh, to make sure they can't be tampered with. Um, you know, detecting anomalies. You know, doing uh, proper incident response and so on. Uh, those are all key requirements that apply equally to small companies as well as large. And the other consideration, which again has come to the forefront in terms of uh, some of the privacy and other regulations like GDPR, comes around, uh, comes to the, co the topic of data sovereignty. In other words, you need to be able to prove where that your data is being stored uh, f based on the population that you're serving. Right. So if you've got one customer, you know, in Europe, you better be able to prove that their data is not leaving Europe kind of thing. Um, on the architecture side, uh, side, you know, as a service and managed services are preferable for obvious reasons, just because it's, you know, a, a lower uh, barrier of entry and, and uh, you know, supports you know, the smaller organizations because they have, you know, optional uh, people that can bring to bear to, to run the, the stuff for them. Uh, being able to quickly provision it, uh, implement, and scale those those systems, uh, you know, you don't want to have to be in a situation where you you know put in a security solution and it takes you a year to get it fine tuned and operating. You know, um, 
meanwhile you're you know you're dealing with all those issues still you know and then simplified integration you know i used to do uh some of the integration work with with um you know a, a sim product and you know and that's not trivial you know if if mm. you can do uh, leverage you know pre-built integrations or have someone who will do the integration for you then that's that's massive and then lastly the cost uh, and we touched on this earlier but you know a, a predictable cost structure is is huge uh, mm. for any size company but particularly for smbs because you know they uh, tend to be very price sensitive um and then and so what we're looking at there is rather than usage-based pricing you know it might be you know workload or data based you know if you can do a flat based user based pricing schedule uh, that's much more uh, predictable uh, yep. for an organization and also to have uh, uh, flexibility there so you can you know go up and down you know as the as your needs dictate and then there's lots of other factors that affect the TCO particularly uh, human resource requirements how many people does it take to run it how much training do they need how much update do you need to do all that kind of classic maintenance overhead thoughts on that yeah it's 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 a really interesting kind of evolution that we've seen partly just because of the the data warehousing of like revolution quote unquote that we've seen going from data warehousing to data lakes and now we're moving into new fun different ways there was a partnership announced between microsoft and google today which is just craziness in regard to data lakes so we're, we're continuing to see this evolution and while I, I do think that will result in you know inevitably less cost to organizations for storing data the need to analyze that data that need to have value out of your that data does, hasn't really changed generally speaking um, so making sure that you can really get everything out of your environment and be able to review it, audit it, determine where there are threats in your environment or risks in your environment is, is really kind of the most important part. And generally, the interesting part for me as someone who's you know built a SIM XDR product is the, the integrations and the parsing are probably one of the areas that, as Mark pointed out, that most people don't really think about. They think like, well, it's just table stakes. But it, it, mm -hmm. it varies so heavily depending on the different technology, how it's applied, how it's working. And for the most part, the, the, how, what your technology stack is and what you want to get out of it is kind of the most important part of that question. And also, what more can you generate to get insights into your environment? Um, which is to say, you know, we see this pretty often. Like if I, if I pulled our customers that are, let's say, 1,000 users, I could find you some that ship 50 gigs a day and some that ship a terabyte a day. And it really is just because they are varied in regard to how they use technology. And to Mark's point, that's where that user-based pricing really comes into play, where most organizations that aren't really heavily technical, and even ones that are, they have no idea how much data they're going to generate. They have no idea how much is going to come out. And, you know, worst case, there are a reason that there isn't a lot of data buddy being generated is because you have pulled back on what you're shipping or because you just don't have visibility into certain things. So making sure you have that predictable factor will solve a lot of kind of your inherent problems just because that means that you can provide more data, you can analyze more data, you can do more to provision that out into your environment. And, you know, we hear Bloomira, I mean, you, anyone who looks into Bloomira, and I'm sure I'll talk about this a little bit more, we say it takes a day to get up and going inside of Bloomira, and we mean that it takes a day to get up and going inside of Bloomira. And we believe, you know, us as well as all the other security organizations out there really need to make that as fast as possible. Um, because we, we, you know, I don't think any of us want to go back to the days where we were buying a server, racking it, and just kind of hoping that sometime in the next year we would get around to doing something with it. <laughs> that wasn't great back then, it, so there's not really a need for us to go and replicate it, especially as we have the flexibility of the cloud behind it as well. Yeah, you hit on a really good point there, and that is <clears throat> time to value is key. Um, you know, there's total cost of ownership, which is, you know, ultimately what you're budgeting for, but also how quickly are we going to get value out of this thing? Like you said, uh, are yep. you going to put this thing in and, you know, do we need to let it percolate and, and be customized for six months before we really get anything good out of it? Or, you know, do we start yep. seeing value quickly? Yeah, ideally immediately. Yes, immediately, if not sooner. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Okay. So uh, concluding kind of my part of it, then we're going to segue into and, and let Matt talk a little bit more about Blumira. Uh, 
you know, the nice thing is SMBs now have access to what I'm calling a right-sized XDR, one that's really designed for uh, for those size of organizations. You know, they're cloud native, um, they have and are designed to satisfy specific use cases that SMBs have, you know, and they're affordable. Um, the ability to self-manage it, have it fully manage it or do hybrid is, is key. And then, you know, as far as cost considerations, look at cost, look at deployment time and TCO, as we just talked about, you know, and then remember, you know, XDR is a relatively new concept, but almost every one of those things underneath are mature underlying technology. They've been around. It's just really, you know, XDR is more of a marketing term than anything. You know, it's, it's just a bundle kind of, yep. <laughs> I mean, it has great ideas great concepts underneath, you know, the, the unified UI, the data lake, all that kind of stuff is great. But most of those technologies are, have been around and they're very mature. Yeah, I, 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 very much so. Um, it's, it's one of those, you know, I think whenever the industry adds a new piece of lingo, uh, acronym, whatever, ZTNA, XDR, whatever, whatever we can find to add into the industry. <laughs> we'll find more. Don't get me wrong. Sassy. Give us, yeah, sassy. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it's only going to get worse. Um, right. There's always usually a, a reason for it. Uh, sometimes those reasons aren't great. Uh, XDR really is focused around how to bundle those together, to your point, Mark. Uh, and, you know, I think those key considerations make a really good kind of point of that of if you're bundling all those things together, shouldn't you also realize less cost, better deployment time, and better TCO? And that isn't necessarily what you do realize through LXDR. So it is important when you're picking what you want to pick and, and leverage into your environment. Because you, you don't want something that was just renamed XDR, but you still have all the, the old pain associated with it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you need it to satisfy your problems, you know, solve your problems. And yep. <laughs> immediately earlier that, rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. All right, with that, I will turn it over and Matt will let you drive from here and uh, you know chime in as, as appropriate. All right, sounds good. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, and this is really gonna be just generally a continuation of what we've been talking about, uh, which is Blumira's SIM, which we call SIM plus XDR uh, for IT teams. Uh, we focus really entirely on how to solve problems for the IT team and security team, smaller security teams at the very least, inside of the small and medium sized businesses. Um, this generally, you know, as the market and the world has changed, especially post 2016 when WannaCry really kicked the ransomware fun off for all of us. Uh, not that ransomware hasn't been around before that, but 2016 with uh, the equation group getting beat and all the fun around it really changed the market uh, and it changed the defensive world as well. And you know, it put organizations that previously didn't really think they had a need for a SIM or an XDR into a position where not only did they need that, but they now were starting to get insurance and other people pushing on them and saying, hey, this is this is really important for you. So one of the reasons that we started at Bloomera, and Bloomera started in 2018, so we've been around for, for a good number of years now, uh, and my background is in MSPs uh, and building out services for MSPs and on the offensive and defensive side as well as startups. So entirely my kind of uh, focus is how do you solve problems as fast as possible in a way that maintains security and maintains sanity of the person doing that work. Uh, anyone who's worked in IT and security knows that it's, you know, this inherently painful thing at times where you never have enough time or you never have enough information or you never have enough budget available to really be successful in the role you're in. And it's really important from our perspective that we make all those things better for the customer. It just is. Um, because, you know, classically, anyone who's used a SIM uh, and or is used, you know, we'll stick with a SIM, has run into situations where either integration was hard or onboarding was hard or it was really hard to get, you know, time to value associated with that. And it's one of the areas that really we believe is of paramount importance within the XDR world. So as we look at Blumira's XDR platform, kind of how we approach it, we approach it from more of the open XDR side. So we bring in a large amount of different types of data uh, going back to Mark's point about the third-party integrations, uh, we pull in, it's about, you know, 
We have 170 different types of data we support, ranging from, you know, SOM01 to CrowdStrike to your Carbon Blacks to your ESET. Like, whatever you're using, we'll pull in your data uh, because, realistically, that's the best way for us and you to get that visibility into what's happening inside of your environment. Uh, similarly, we don't want you to have to figure out how to respond to things or what to do. So that's why, as a part of our kind of SOAR structure, we have our own automated response playbooks. We have automated responses that can isolate threats or block IPs for you. Uh, and we do all that through our own automated managed detections, which is to say, and I alluded to this earlier, we have our own detection engineering team that's full time here. There are four of them, and all they do is write detections and look at your data. That's all they do. And we do that because we think it is important for organizations to gain the benefit of what we see in all other organizations, which is to say, you know, Blue Mira, we've grown a lot over the last uh, five, six years, however long 2018 was ago. I honestly don't know anymore. It feels like 30 years. Um, and what it allows us to do is say, all right, across our thousands of customers that are all very similar in how they look. Where are we seeing threats against these customers? What is a ransomware looking like when it starts to get near these environments? And how can we make sure we detect that ahead of it? And then using our automated kind of backend structure to deploy that out to everyone. So people that are on Blue Mira get new detections every week because they get the benefit of that detection engineering that's going on in the background continuously. Uh, similarly, you know, we want people to be able to meet their compliance and get what they need out of their compliance environment. And that's really kind of the, the I will say the harder part that we're starting to see inside of XDR is that when it's pure XDR, not SIM plus XDR, quote unquote, we're starting to see more of a focus on, well, you can respond, it's endpoint focused, it does what it needs to do. But it makes it a lot harder to get the value you need for the compliance side. And if you are NIST or PCI or doing any CMFC, anything where you need to generate evidence to pull out to give to your auditor, the XDRs that aren't necessarily focused on the data, which is to say, you know, audit logs out of your environment, being able to see just all of your Windows logs that are coming out of your environment, you won't necessarily get the fidelity you want out of every XDR product. Whereas Bumira focuses really heavily on just pulling in as much as possible. And this goes back to the previous topic of it's not your response. It shouldn't be your responsibility to scale an XDR or SIM. It should be the responsibility of the product. Uh, and that's really how we focus heavily across kind of all of these different environments. So making sure that we can pull in any data, making sure that we can automate areas where we can, making it easier for you and making sure that those compliance controls are met and not just met, but also easy to show to your auditor. So I'm going to run through this real quick because it's only so interesting for everyone is how Blue Mirror works. So we are not a lot different in how we collect data. We have our own sensor that goes into environments. We have our own cloud connectors that do API to API, and we have our own agent that can pull in your EDR logs. Some of the magic of our agent really is more associated with how we pull in those logs and what they are. We handle all of the configuration on what should come out. We handle all the configuration on if there are new data sources that need to come out. So to give you an example, if there was a new attack, like when printer spooler uh, Privest started uh, a year and a half ago or so, uh, we just spit up a new way to collect uh, your spooler Windows logs and start deploying detections associated with that with no need for the organization to touch the agent that's actually on those hosts. So you get this really tight stack between one, two, and three that allows you to say, well, I deploy these agents and I don't need to worry anymore. Or I deployed these cloud connector. I don't need to worry anymore because I know in section two, I'm going to be deploying rules associated with those types. I have threat hunting that's going on in the background. The company is handling all the data parsing for me. That's going to result in detections for me as well with playbooks associated with every detection. So it's really driven to make life as easy as possible. And in any situation where, you know, you get stuck, we have our own security operations team that's available 24-7 for support. And in general, you know, as you think about OpenXDR, one of the, the areas is, well, what data do you support? And we at Blumira continue to expand every week, really. Well, we'll say every month for the sake of my engineering team, um, into new integrations that are part of the Blumira ecosystem. So ranging from you know your Microsoft 365, which 91% you know, of Blumira 
customers are on Microsoft 365 to tell you how pervasive it is in the environment in general, all the way down to, you know, your semantic. Uh, it really allows you to get that visibility across your environment and be successful in any different way, ranging from compliance to actual threat detection. So, you know, like we've seen Okta continue to grow in topic over the last few weeks, largely because of all their security issues and then resulting in customers getting hacked, um, which, which you bet I had a conversation the other day where um, my support team wanted to give a HAR file to someone. And I was like, you will sanitize the crap out of that file before you send it to anyone, which is exactly how Okta was getting hit. Uh, and for example, we bring in your Okta logs. We'll tell you when someone is password spraying into your Okta environment or attacking your Okta environment because it's important for you to get fidelity across that entire environment, just generally speaking. And that also goes down into what else? Password managers, being able to pull in your email security, and just broadly any sort of your web servers. And that's the area that, that I always think is really important to make sure you have coverage the amount of attacks that Boomera has detected off IAS being attacked is probably more than any other way that we've detected attacks across this environment. So it's really important to think about not only what is available from a, you know, NGAV, XDR, fancy stuff perspective, but also the classic, just I want to grab some IAS logs and pull them out and I want to have them stored so I can review them. And that is difficult if you're stuck in a place where data is controlling you, but it's a lot easier if it's you're just a, if it's a situation where it's like, yes, please send that data. We will allow you to detect threats on it. There's no additional costs associated with it. Lumira is of course not unique in that, but we do think that we approach it in a way that is uh, necessarily relevant. Uh, and I think it's important for organizations to look for XDR solutions that allow you to engage in that way. Because if you don't, then you always run into a situation. We saw this with no offense to them, because the technology is great, Exabeam, where you have to really limit down the amount of technology you're putting into it or data you're putting into it at the very least because of how expensive it is. And it's really important for SMBs especially to have that flexibility and how data works. It just, it just is, or you miss things. So the success model, and that's really what's most important. How do we get people into the environment? Generally, onboarding takes less than a day. I say a day because most people don't believe it takes two to eight hours to onboard and do a SIM XDR, um, which I don't blame them for because I wouldn't believe it either if I didn't build this company. Uh, but it is a really fast onboarding, and it's really important for it to be fast because, you know, in this day and age, we all expect there to be value in something we do. We None of us have enough time to really just kind of dedicate open days to just hoping that we can make something work. Uh, so ensuring that you can get on board as fast as possible without roadblocks is always really important. And being able to get that auto updating, you know, the automated tooting, the automated detection rules, new integrations being provided to you, continuous improvements associated with it, not having to worry about parsing. Like these are all really big benefits that allow your organization to focus on, uh, as Mark said earlier, the fun stuff, the important stuff, the stuff you want to do in your environment. Those are the things that, like, those are always more important. Wouldn't you rather help your organization grow than worry about how to get your Sims data storage to work correctly and to correctly be set up as a, a DAS to your SXI to make up the data out? Like, no one, like, I understand why we did that. For a long time, I was building servers nightly, fixing raids nightly, but we are able to kind of move past that, and especially for SMBs that don't have that kind of deep need or you know, already purchased hardware that a lot of this is going into, this is an opportunity for them to, to really kind of change how they approach things. We have a few different features, uh, licensed ones. I'm gonna like make you all look at a chart, um, but by all means, please go to our site, please review this in the slides. We essentially tear this out between free, you can use it, stores data for 14 days, go wild, do whatever you want, pick three integrations. Uh, we might annoy you every once in a while to see if you're interested in buying Bloomera, but it is free to use, generally speaking. Um, and on Sim Pro to Sim Plus, it really is a matter of what do you need out of your environment? What are you trying to get out of it? Are you just needing to pull in some syslog data, or cloud data, or do you have these deep compliance needs across the environment? Um, so it's it's very much focused on what is needed for you, what is needed for your environment. Do you have people built out? And we also work 
with MSPs just as much. So if you're an MSP watching this, uh, we have an MSP side of the house that will allow you to kind of leverage these different tiers in an automated fashion. And then you don't even have to talk to anyone if you don't want to, which is great. Unless you want to talk to us, then you can talk to us. And in general, all of our customers, you know, thankfully love us. And if you go and you look at our G2 reviews, you'll see that, that we always are at the top of uh, SIM um, support. Um, I'm sure soon uh, XDR support as well as that gets rolled into the G2 area. Uh, and we always believe that the best way to provide organizations with the most success, especially in XDR, especially in SMB, is to have good quality customer support that must really kind of solve the problem for them. Um, so the product is an amazing product. It does a great job of leading people to the problems, helping them solve that problem. But if there's ever a situation where you need help, and that question may be like, I want to get a new firewall. What firewall should I get? There is a team available to support those questions, ranging from your solution architect to the security operations team that really helps with providing that quality of value and the quality of data and just allows you to grow and mature as an organization. And really, that was kind of the gist of Blumira when we started at Blumira in 2018 was, you know, there has to be a path for SMBs to grow. There has to be a path for them to use technology that helps them get better. And, you know, enterprise technology is not built inherently to make people better. It's built to use. It's built to function. It's built to be defined with a SOP or some sort of process and say, this is how we're going to use it. This is how it's going to make us better. These are our metrics associated with it. And in SMB, you don't really have that luxury. You only really have what's available to you in time. So it's important for the technology you're using to make life easier for you. Uh, and that is why we built Blumira uh, and why we continue to really drive Blumira across the industry as well. Um, and we would love uh, for all of you watching to try it out. What do you think, Mark? Excellent. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that came out of that uh, that I think was really cool, and I hadn't really thought about this before, was um, kind of the crowdsourcing, if you will, that you guys mm. can do, you know, in, in terms of, you know, building the, the uh, you know, the, what would you call them, the analytics, uh, the detections, right? Detections, yeah. um, especially because you're kind of combining the what you're seeing across all your SMB customers, right, which are... Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of commonalities, you know, in, in because of their customer size and the challenges and all that. So, you know, you guys can build some some really interesting uh, customized um, detections, which is very cool. It's it's the uh, best way to reduce noise, and in, in our experience, if yeah. you can if you can get ahead of false positive tuning by looking at five thousand organizations, you can make life easier for everyone. Right. Exactly. Cool. All right. Well, let's. Uh, we've got about seven minutes, so let's jump in and take a few questions. Again, if you uh, all have any questions, feel free to to put them in, and uh, I'll just kind of jump through a few of these <clears throat> real quickly. You know, one of them is pretty interesting, I think. And the question is, you know, what's the crossover between the data involved in XDR and user and NAB? user and entity behavior analytics or UEBA um, and are they mutually exclusive and <clears throat> I think the answer is no they're not because UEBA kind of depends on the data you know that's going to come in from the XGR especially on the endpoint side right. you know and the, the idea there is you know you're looking for uh, anomalous behavior you know and and that applies not to just uh, the endpoint but also you know your NDR your network information and other logs and so on you know, but but user behavior is huge, you know, in terms of especially getting ahead of threats. You know, to your point earlier, Matt, you talked about, you know, how can we detect when somebody's doing something they're not supposed to be doing, either, you know, if it's an insider or an external person acting as an insider. Uh, that's a key way to detect that. Any thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, the UEBA market has... I don't know if it's evolved over the last 10 to 15 years, but it's continued to stay as like this, it feels special. So is it special? And what we've really learned over the last you know, five years, especially as data analysis has grown in its capabilities, is that there really is not a true difference between the two. Uh, and they are in many ways directly crossed over with each other, which isn't to say there aren't you know, unique ways to solve problems in UEBA, 
you know, training AI models on that specific organization to now know what the baseline is and then look for these specific areas. However, in our experience, that solution isn't necessary for a lot of SMBs. It is overkill for a lot of SMBs. Really what they need is that just insight into when something strange is occurring, which is to say, you know, do you want to know when a user logs in in New York and then logs in in Russia? Yeah, you probably do want to know that there was some impossible travel that occurred or that user logged in two different places. Even if you do business in Russia, you don't want a user that logged in within 10 minutes of each other between one and the other place. So it, it is one of those areas that it's more about the data being available, performing the analysis on that data, and making it readily kind of actionable by the organization to do something about it. So I don't think it's necessarily crossed over. I think it's just a how we look at UEBA. So like we'll do a lot of detection work around people accessing a lot of files in SharePoint or people accessing a lot of files on a Windows machine. And that isn't really relevant necessarily inherently indi indicative of a threat, but it very much could be, or it could be indicative of, you know, an internal user ripping data out of your environment. It could be indicative of someone getting ready to perform ransomware and starting to exfil a lot of data. It could be indicative of a number of different things, but what it's not indicative of is a normal user action. So the way that we generally look at this is XDR and UVA directly overlap when there are patterns to detect that are not normal user behaviors. And in those situations, you can do a lot to generate those types of detections that really drive success around is something weird happening? Do I need to do something about this? How do I make sure that this isn't a true threat? So I, I think they're very much overlapped. I still think there's some super cool ways to do UV out there that don't scale for crap, and maybe one day they will. Um, but for right now, you know, I think a lot of success for SMBs can be focused around how do I find that low-hanging fruit that has to happen by attackers? Logging in from a weird place, creating mail forwarding rules, creating global admins, doing stuff that should not happen. Or if it does happen, it should happen so rarely that that alert is one of those like, yep, it's good I know that that domain admin was created. I did that on purpose. Because I guarantee you want to know when you didn't do it on purpose just as much. <laughs> yeah, and I think you hit one, one big point there, which is a lot of the U, UEBA solutions were designed for large organizations who yeah. uh, need that kind of technology because they have such complex infrastructures. Right. Right. You know, things like, you know, what's happening, you know, in some far flung endpoint, uh, which could translate into, especially if you combine it with entity analytics, you know, to, you know, to be able to track lateral movement, that kind of stuff, which is much easier to do in, in the smaller organizations because it's much more obvious. <laughs> right. Um, yes. And converse and as well, the UEBA tends to be pretty spendy, you know, pretty expensive as well, uh, not only to acquire, but to implement. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, uh, there are a couple questions in here that came in that we've already covered. Uh, one was around, you know, native XTR versus open XTR. I think we touched on that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about AI because that's hot. Obviously, everybody. So I was just sitting through a Microsoft's Ignite um, mm. conference, which is going on today through Friday, and I think I counted 96 sessions that have AI in the title. <laughs> so it's pretty it's pretty top of mind for a lot of folks. So the question is, how are you seeing vendors implementing AI for threat detection in SIM and XDR tools? And from my perspective, it's early days. Um, you know, classic AI, which I define as machine learning, has been used for a decade or more in some instances, right? Especially around UEBA as a perfect example. Um, but really what the focus of a lot of people asking questions today is around gen AI, generative AI. And that's really early days. I mean, I've seen a few demos here and there, um, but they're all not even in proof of concept, right? It's just, it's just super early. Uh, a lot of folks are um, being very cautious about generative AI because it's still so new and, you know, they're afraid of things like hallucinations and things polluting the, the results. So um, I think it's going to come, it'll happen down the road, but, but it's very, very new. Uh, anyway, thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would, I would echo that, you know, the complexity of machine learning in SMB is very similar to the complexity of UVA in SMB versus enterprise, which is to say, you know, you don't need a gigantic baseline model in an SMB to, uh, to detect threats. You don't necessarily need it depending on an enterprise, depending on how you're looking at threats either. Um, but in either case, 
it requires a lot of scale. It requires a lot of compute to make it kind of hum the way you want it to. And Gen AI definitely has added a new wrinkle to everything, especially because, you know, can Gen AI just do everything for us? Can that just be the, the answer? It just does everything and we sleep, which would be great if that could be the answer. Um, but it's <laughs> the technology really, you know, it's a great first line, you know, information generator. However, the big issue that I think this industry is currently combating when it comes to Gen AI is that it's not guaranteed correct. And unless you have someone there who can audit it and say, hey, I got this insight from Gen AI as it pertains to this thing, I know this is right or I know this is half right, that can be really beneficial to organizations. However, an SMB don't necessarily have that. You don't necessarily have someone who's an expert that can say like, I'm a human in the loop. I know that this is not right, or I know this is right in this way. And I do think that while you will see Gen AI continuously adopted, like we're of course looking at how we could include Gen AI, because why, why wouldn't we look at that? But it is one of those areas that like, don't get me wrong. I've done a number of the of work of demos and work around it lately. And the biggest issue is that if you can't guarantee correctness, then you can't guarantee trust. And then you really need a human in the loop to make it a successful thing. So I, I do think you'll see more of it. I think, you know, I don't think you'll see a lot more ML grow outside of specific use cases. Like let's build an ML model, let's see what processes have been used broadly across all of them and apply scores. Like I think that's a really useful way to use ML across your detection stack. But, you know, Gray Noise has done a really good job of using a, a Gen AI to tag data. I think you'll see more of that, but I think until these Gen AI models are able to get to a more comfortable place. You're always going to have a human in the loop doing stuff, at least validating stuff. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. All right, well, we are at time, so uh, I want to thank uh, you know Blumira and Matt for uh, being on today. This Ooh. has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, if you want more information, of course, you can go to Blumira's website. Uh, if you want more information about S and P uh, and uh, 451 Research, our link is there. Uh, if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to Matt or myself. Our email addresses were uh, at the front of the deck. So uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for your time and um, have a great day and stay safe and secure out there. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you.